basically he's citing Husserl all the time. Of course, he's also citing Heidegger, but he really downplays his um, influence, the influence of Heidegger on his work. And he clearly just says, I'm sort of following in the footsteps of Husserl. So that's an interesting, another interesting uh, relationship between uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty, Heidegger and Husserl. A, a couple more and then I'll stop sort of talking about the philosophical genealogy. Derrida uh, wrote his first book on Husserl, on Husserl's book on geometry. Um, and then the other really famous phenomenologist, which is interesting that phenomenology became so strong in France, is Paul Ricoeur. And Paul Ricoeur was also the person who translated ideas into French, one of the early translation of Husserl's ideas. Now, Paul Ricoeur has a very interesting remark about phenomenology and Husserl's influence. He says that the history of phenomenology is a history of revolts against Husserl. So I think that's a nice way of understanding the difference between Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Levinas, Derrida, et cetera, Ricoeur, a whole range of other people, all who were influenced by Husserl and yet found various aspects of his work unsatisfying or limited and then moved into some things of, of, of uh, developments in phenomenological thought of their own. Um, while accepting, obviously, some of the... Sorry. Um, accepting some of the basic principles of Husserl's work. Okay, so that's like a really, a really brief, given that I'm not actually a, a philosopher or a history of historian of philosophy, um, there's just sort of some of the relationships that I've gleaned as I've been reading into from the phenomenological tradition. Now, my second note before I start talking about phenomenology is a very brief one about social science. It, it seems to me there's a lack of clarity on what actual the social sciences are or what social science is. I'm not sure myself of the genealogy of the term, the social sciences. Maybe it could go back to, to Auguste Comte or someone. You could imagine that he may have been someone who would begin to think of a new multidisciplinary new way of thinking about sort of the social causes of reality and he might have called it social science but for me it's a bit unclear because I feel like I know what the discipline of sociology sort of is or the discipline of anthropology human geography etc I'm not that clear about social science the, however the reason why maybe it's still a useful term to talk about is that the social sciences are, are everywhere. I mean, and of course, this is not, is also at Macquarie University. I mean, last year, we were a discipline of anthropology. We were a department of anthropology. This year, we're now a discipline of anthropology in a new school of social sciences. So this very year, we've been restructured into a school of social sciences, which did make me wonder, okay, what does it mean to, what is the school of social sciences? What's its focus? Um, and is there any difference between anthropology, sociology, human geography, political science, which at Macquarie are now the disciplines in a new school of social science? So for me, it's just, it's sort of a question, maybe we could talk about that at the end, exactly what the social sciences are. Um, but I, it, it's sort of, a, I guess, a, just an, a, an open question at the moment. So I'm using it in a shorthand way, say, for phenomenology, for disciplines that are not in philosoph philosophy um, and they're not in the sciences, for example, discipline, phenomenology for disciplines, not like cognitive studies, because cognitive science is also at the moment fairly, um, fairly well influenced by phenomenological arguments, but um, we're not going to talk about what's happening there, given that you know, I'm not following and I can't really understand that material. Okay, so sorry, that was a pretty long introduction to what to getting on to my talk. So let me just begin by asking and answering what is phenomenology? And just before I do that, to say again, so this is my interpretation. Um, it's, a, it's a synthesis, let's say, of different people. I 
personally don't really read Heidegger. So my phenomenology is not going to be a very Heideggerian version of it. Other people will you know, come to phenomenology through other people. In a way, I think for myself, Husserl and Merleau-Ponty are the people that I find interesting and useful for thinking about how phenomenology is, is, um, is inspirational for anthropology or for the social sciences. So what is it? Uh, Chris, can I jump in and maybe uh, can we see the slideshow version because we are seeing the upcoming slides in our screen as well. Is ah, there okay. a switch to a uh, regular slideshow if possible? I don't want to interrupt, but. Yeah, no, let me just check the slideshow. Yes. Yes, thanks. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. So at its simplest, a phenomenological social sciences privileges study of the world as it is perceived. So the world here is a shorthand term for any number of things, objects, situations, events, living beings, people, places, ideas. So we could say phenomenology privileges study of objects or things or people or places as they are perceived by, by people. So when we present it like this, we can say that three interrelated building blocks emerge for a phenomenological social science. The first is the world. The second is the ex experience of it. And of course, the third one is the experiencing self, the person who is having the experiences or the person who's perceiving things about them. So I guess we can say like just at a really basic level, a phenomenological social science always involves an investigation into relations between these three thing, things or three themes. So we can now do some more extended definitions to add substance to these first sort of three themes or these of these relationships. Robert Dejale, the anthropologist, he defines anthropology phenomenology as, quote, a method of inquiry that seeks to describe and understand phenomena as they appear to the consciousness of certain peoples. So we can see that he's trying to be more, he's trying to broaden out the definition. For him, experience of the world is redescribed as the perceiving of phenomena. The world is phenomena and the we or the us or the people that experiences phenomena while living can be either an individual, so it's individual perceptions of the world, or it could be expanded to incorporate a group or a class. I mean, let's say, I guess, Merleau Ponty in his early work would have talked about a class consciousness, a class consciousness way of having the world revealed to you and perceiving the world. So interestingly, when we have a look at Dejale's definition or the formulation, phenomena for him present themselves to us. <clears throat> and not only to us as people, he's more precise. He says, phenomena manifest themselves, not just to a person, but more particularly to our consciousness. And there's one of the key words for phenomenology. Phenomenology is interested in consciousness. Husserlian phenomenology is interest, interested in consciousness. Okay, now, although Dejale's definition holds true for much of our experience of the world, I mean, in, in a way that our passive experiences of the world, when, when you think about when we walk in the forest, we hear a lot of birds, but we can't necessarily see them. So those sort of, those sounds just present themselves to us. But there is, I think you could see something a little bit passive in the language that Dejale uses to talk about perception. So phenomenology has another focus, and that is that it also directs our attention to a second feature of consciousness, and that is to how our consciousness interprets and actively shapes the sensefulness of things for us. So we can say phenomenology is interested in how, how consciousness, brings, consciousness brings meaning to the being of, you no, know, to things, to the being of the world, and is also interested in how consciousness subjectively constitutes the significance of phenomena for the self. 
So there is a certain individualism in Husserlian phenomenology. He's really interested in subjective interpretations of the world. Of course, being a philosopher, he does want to somehow or other lay, make a, a link between how we subjectively constitute or interpret or perceive the world and the real world. But he's not that concerned with the real world. He has a critique of the idea, actually, of a real world. And he's more interested in our, uh, our own perceptions, our own experiences of the world in general and of particular things as well. Okay, so I know this might be confusing. Sorry about that. So the phenomenology actually is really, really difficult, I reckon. Um, and it's hard to make a link from phenomenology to social science, but let me go on. Now, how, how might a phenomenological social science understand the entwining of passive and active perception? You know, when you walk in a forest, lots of things, we perceive them, but we're not actually directing our attention to them but they're in the background and, and yet when we do start directing our attention, we begin to notice particular things about them. So there's both, we can see really a passive and an active perception of the world happening at the very same time. So I think that's sort of a, a helpful hint, hint about this question. Of, sorry, I just heard something come across the, there. <laughs> a helpful hint about how active and passive perception, our active perce passive perception of the world comes together. We can see it in, in poetry in particular. Of course, Heidegger in his later life was really interested in how poetry reveals things about the world. Um, and I like these two poems, one by Orhan Veli, Istanbul Adin Liorum, um, where he says, I'm, I'm listening to Istanbul, but my eyes are closed. I'm deliberately trying to give my attention to the sounds that are around me. And the best way to do it is to, is to shut my eyes so I can begin to discriminate between those phenomena that are appearing to me. Um, but you can see he, ha he actively pursues a type of passive um, position vis-a-vis -vis the city or the world. Walt Mittman says something similar in his poem, Song of Myself, he says, I think I will do nothing for a long time, but listen and accrue what I hear into myself and let sounds contribute towards me. So I think both of those poems affirm something really significant it's about phenomenological social science. They, they tell us that hearing isn't passive, but it's an event. And, and it doesn't, that hearing doesn't just go on as we live but that actually when we begin to think about what it means to hear the world, we begin to see that um, we, we're backgrounding and foregrounding what the world sounds like according to our interest at the time, according to our position, according to a whole range of other factors. I mean, let me go back to my example. Think about walking in the forest and also think about walking in the forest and talking on your phone at the same time as I do nearly every morning. I, I then arrive home and I think to myself, wow, I've just been walking in the forest, but because my attention was on uh, talking with my brother or something, I haven't listened to anything in the forest. I'm, I, I've completely ignored that aspect of the world because all my attention was on another aspect of the world. So we begin, of course, to see the very specificity of perception um, that phenomenology is interested in. Uh, and the problematizing of perception that ph phenomenology is doing. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna do one, one more sort of descriptive thing about phenomenology, and then I'm gonna go on to the most exciting ideas of phenomenology for a social science. But first I've got to set up you know, some of the basic uh, foundational aspects of phenomenology. So we can describe in different words this analysis of the entangled relations between, now I'm gonna put it in a different word, between an activist constitution of the world, that is our active listening to the world and choosing between what we hear and what we see, etc. So the world doesn't just appear to us, we actually constitute the world for ourselves 
as we notice particularly things about it and as we ignore other things about it because our attention can't take in everything. So we constitute, we have an activist constitution of the world, but of course, phenomenology also says at the very same time, the world reveals itself to our consciousness. So we've got a, an interesting complication. Consciousness constitutes the world, even at the same time as we're faced with worlds that insist upon us recognizing something about their reality. So putting now that together, perception therefore always involves a perceiving self. And that's why for Husserl, he, his, and why other phenomenologists had a heavy criticism of Husserl is that Husserl, I don't know if he invented a term, but he used the term, the transcendental ego. And in his last book, unpublished work, he changed his mind and he didn't call it the ego because he didn't like a Freudian psychological implication. And he talked about the transcendental person. That is the transcendental person who over and above the fact that you and I are, of course, uh, socialized by our society, we're certain types of people, we, um, we have a lot of our skills and attributes are given to us by being in certain positions. Well, over and above that, Husserl wanted to say, there is still an activist aspect of being a human being, which is, which is somewhat individual, and he's gonna call that a transcendental person. Now that's a really big debate, obviously, in phenomenology, um, and especially in social sciences. The social sciences, I would say, isn't, isn't on the, the social sciences in the main are not disciplines that want to say the individual is the, is the beginning of social meaning. Actually, in the main, I would say the social sciences go back the other way. They want to say people are socialised by their society, uh, that we are social beings, and the most important aspect, therefore, of our perception is that our perception is somehow or other corporate somehow or other extra individual, not just something that or no Daria or Chris or Safa or something see for themselves, but also something that we see as being members of different types of groups. And of course, the social science word, even then groups is not necessarily a very useful word. Quite often social scientists use words like social structures. Social structures are more important for social science, I would say, um, than individuals, and that's what makes social science, you know, makes it hold together. They're the disciplines that are trying to investigate social causes for things that happen, for events, and try to put individuals somehow or other into those linkages of social structures, etc. So you can talk about how, especially in structuralism, structures produce people. People are just, you know, something like they're objects in a network. All of those things are ways that um, social science talk about individuals, whereas Husserlian phenomenology actually has a category of the transcendental person who is also a perceiving being, is a constituting being, because the, the, the true word for, for, for Husserl is constitution, as we'll see. Okay, so perception for Husserl always involves a perceiving self. So we can say the phenomenology of perception takes an approach to the world that considers the various intentional acts and the embodied experiential processes that constitute its significance for ourselves. Now, that's interesting for the social science, but you know, Husserl, when he's doing his work way back in, 19, in the 1900s, there isn't a thing called social science. Actually, Husserl is making an argument against the natural sciences. So Husserl's phenomenology rejects a naturalistic science that maintains that things are objectively noble in themselves. Because what he wants to argue is that entities are meaningful or known only in relation to the purposes and to the consciousness of the perceiver. And you can see that Husserl is, because he was a mathematician, he's very well aware of the natural sciences. And he's making an argument to say, the idea of the natural sciences, that nature you know, is an object of cognition, 
He says what it ignores is that the event of the cognizing of nature by the scientist is just taken for granted, is I ignored in. So the, the, the idea that, that the natural sciences just get the real objective world and the person who is in looking, looking at the world, which is you know, the way that the natural sciences, some of them work with um, microscopes and making everything really small, for example, the person who's looking at the world, it makes no difference what their subjectivity is to the world that they discover. That is the, you know, the, the philosophy of the natural sciences. So at the core, Husserlian phenomenology is a critique of natural science. And that means it's interesting to think about how is phenomenology useful for the social sciences? Because some social sciences are also, as you can see by the word science, also would have certain presumptions about naturalism, that, you know, that culture really exists out there. And it doesn't matter when I, or let's say, given that this, you know, what, who we are today, that Islam really exists out in the world and that it doesn't matter about who the person who's trying to define and who's trying to live Islam, there is a real objective Islam and that's the most important thing that you have to know about. That maybe is what certain types of social scientists might say about Islam. Of course, phenomenology would just say it's gone completely the wrong way around. Okay, so uh, Husserl rejects that type of science because he wants to say that Entities are meaningful or known only in relation to the purposes and the consciousness of the perceiver. Remember, perception always involves a perceiving self. So let me give an example, a really simple one. Imagine a real estate agent who's, who sees the house. So what, how does the real estate agent see or interpret the house? They see the house as an object of sale. When they come to your house and they're, they're going to go and give you a quote, they're not looking at the house as a place for living in. They're looking at the house as a object of sale and business. It's just a different perspective. That's often not, that's all Husserl is saying, but we have to take account on the fact that there is radically different perspectives on the world and those perspectives constitute the world. It's not like there is a real house and that the real estate is right and that we who love our house and live in our rooms and Put it, make it all special for ourselves, that there's something wrong with that idea of the house. Not, neither one of them is naturally true. And the important thing is to think about the instituting processes that go into producing the idea and the experience of the house. Or well, let me give another example and it's coming more into the natural sciences. Now, imagine a rock, a piece of stone. For a mining geologist, let's say a natural scientist, they may analyze that rock and appreciate that rock for its mineral and for its chemical composition, for its perme permeability or porosity, you know, that how, how thick is it, maybe for the size of its particles, and we would call that science. However, an artist might look at the very same rock and notice that rock for how it might fit into an art installation. Same rock, completely different perceptive regimes to how you're, going to, how you're going to use it. A child might look at the very same rock and say, I love that rock because that was given to me by my favourite auntie. Another, same rock, different type of constitution. By contrast, let's say, uh, in the work of Fred Myers, when he's working with the Pintubi Aboriginals in Central Australia, he tells us that for many Indigenous people there, a rock might be valued for its connection to dreaming events. No one small feature in a region of known and sacred places. So what can we say? We can say that in all of these cases, different educated, you know, all of these are educated perspectives on a rock, all these different educated, imaginative and affective perceptions govern actors' way of reckoning with the very same rock. And, of course, nothing stops an Aboriginal geologist or an Aboriginal artist from also shifting between those perspectives. Um, so I think for Husserl, that's what he means to say the core aspect that he's interested in is in people's constitution of the world, 
which then, of course, raises a, the question about the person who perceives. And so I'll go right back to the first slide and the, the core components of phenomenology, the world, the perceptions of it, and the person who's perceiving. So I would say any phenomenological social science has to examine relations between those three aspects. All right. Sorry, I know <clears throat> I've gone, I haven't got much time, so I think I might go a bit quicker here. And I hope this will be a, you know, not so technical um, and, I, and, I'll, and not so introductory, and I want to talk about another topic. So as you can see on the slide, I want to talk about phenomenology's six most useful ideas for, uh, for social science. Or we can say, what do I think, not just me, obviously, but what do I think of phenomenology's most exciting ideas and concepts for understanding our human engagement with the world, with our peers, with our families, with the, the broader events that we live through, et cetera, et cetera, which is the focus of phenomenology all under the category of the world. So in doing so, I'm going to argue that phenomenology has actually identified or maybe discovered, Husserl said that he discovered certain ideas. We can say it has identified certain elementary features of consciousness through which all humans perceive things, entities, situations, people, the world, etc. Now, of course, there might be other um, elementary features of consciousness that phenomenology hasn't discovered. And I, who, I'm not saying that. I'm just, I just want to look at the ones that are important for phenomenology. So phenomen phenomenology claims that these, these are essential operations and that they pertain to everyone. They pertain to, to no, in that, let's say in anthropology, they pertain to a newer person who's living in the Sudan, to a person living in Sydney, to a person living in Istanbul. Um, and that, that's a radical claim because, of course, the social sciences in some ways is always, uh, always has a tension between universal models, which, you know, about human sociality or something, and, of course, with a debunking of human, of universal models in the name of some type of particularism. So I think that phenomenology it is making a universal claim, but you, I think you'll see that it's at a very low level. It's not disputing. In fact, it, within it, it's giving, it's giving us an, 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 an ability to say, yes, growing up in Istanbul doesn't make you in some ways the same type of person as someone who grew up in Tokyo. And phenomenology can take account of that, but it also would, would say there's some basic features of how we perceive the world, which is relevant for someone in Tokyo and someone in Istanbul, let's say. Okay, so the first one is constitution. And I've already used that word a few times. So phenomenology identifies consciousness as constitution of the meaning of the world, and it does through by looking at our intentional acts and thoughts and to me, that's the first crucial insight for social science. So for phenomenology, objectivity, that is the act of positing the sense or the value of something for oneself is understood to be constituted out of our subjectivity. So, okay, that sounds confusing to say objectivity is constituted out of our subjectivity. So let me give an example, think because we can all think like this. Think of a person at your work who's difficult to work with for various reasons. Now, phenomenology would draw attention not to some objective assessment that you or I might have of that person. Like we might say something like that. Oh, that person is such an idiot. Or we might go, oh, that person's a psycho. Or we might say, oh, that person's really narcissistic, etc. But phenomenology actually wants to go around the other way around. It wants, prefers to acknowledge that our assessment is better phrased as, according to me, that person is a narcissist. Because what phenomenology wants to draw attention to is the subjective basis 
of our supposedly objective statements. And why it wants to do that is because, not because it just wants to know about you know, how I subjectively understand or interpret something. It actually wants to say that helps us to, to get a self-knowledge about why we constitute the, the world or that person, let's say the difficult person, in a certain way. Now, I'll come on to that later if we have time because that's what Husserl called the phenomenological reduction. Um, but I'll, I'll get that as one of the last most useful ideas of phenomenology. So we can say phenomenology attempts to describe the origin of meaning, our meanings to the world, as deriving precisely from our consciousness, from the meaning-giving acts of our consciousness and from our intentionality, which now our intentions towards something which Husserl says is a constitutive activity. Let's have another example. Sartre, who is also a very famous phenomenologist, describes the, the, this process differently. He says, an emotion is a transformation of the world in which the body, directed by consciousness, changes its relation to the world in order that the world may change its qualities. That's what it means that our objectivity is constituted out of our subjectivity. Sartre is not saying there isn't a world, but he's saying there's an irredeemable subjective aspect to the world and phenomenology is trying to work out what, what that is. So to get, give me an example, I'll give you an example of what Sartre might mean that. Think of the experience of a nightmare. Now we, we all have them every now and again. We wake up in fear. So there's an emotion. And fear, of course, has an embodied dimension. You know, we might be sweating. And as we sweat and as we feel fear after we've just woken up from, night, from a nightmare, we begin to stare at the door of the bedroom because the door is suddenly transformed by our embodied consciousness. I mean, I, I just use that word, our emotions, our embodied consciousness. It's suddenly transformed into an entrance point for a murderer or a monster, whatever the type of nightmare that you've woken up from. So that's what Sartre is saying. When he says that emotion, uh, the body directed by consciousness changes its relations to the world in order that the world may change its qualities, suddenly the bedroom goes from being a place of repose and rest and sleep into the site of a possible murder or a horror story. We constitute subjectively the, the but at that particular time, how we perceive the world and what its meaning is for us. So that's how Sartre put it. Of course, Merle Ponte, who I particularly like, puts it in another way. Now, he gives the example of an unclimbable cliff. Okay, and look what's he, the interesting word here is unclimbable. So he, he says, think about an unclimbable cliff. And then he says, a large or a small vertical or slanting rock are things which have no meaning for anyone who is not intending to climb them. That is, it doesn't make sense to talk about an unclimbable cliff for a subject whose projects do not carve out such determinate forms from the uniform mass of the in itself and cause an oriented world to arise, a significance in things. So what Mulu Ponte is drawing attention is to if we are walking in the forest and we might notice a rock formation, if we're a rock climber, we don't just see a rock formation, right? We see an unclimbable or a climbable rock formation. And as Murdo Ponti says, that perception, our individual perception there, causes a significance in things. And that at the crux is all, if you want a pure description of what a phenomenological approach to the world. It's just trying to understand how it is that a significance in things arises, both from an individual perspective and then as we can see, also from a social perspective. Um, so uh, we can just state, perceiving the world simultaneously involves the constitution of the world's sense. And that is a phenomenological claim and you can take it or you can leave it. Okay, next really useful idea of phenomenology, intersubjectivity. Now, intersubjectivity was a late concern of Husserl, and the reason why not many thinkers like Heidegger knew about 
into subjectivity in Husserl's work is because it was never published. But Merleau-Ponty, when he went to the Husserlian archives, it's when he began to notice that the late Husserl is, is obsessed with the question of not just the subject, individual perception of the world, but what it means to be a person who is intimately in relationships with other people and how that relationship also begins to be a core aspect of how we interpret the world. So intersubjectivity was a Husserlian uh, insight, which of course has become incredibly important over the course of 20th century, so some types of 20th century social science, let's say interactionisms of different type or ethno-methodology. So, a second useful insight of phenomenology's exploration of perception is its complementary analysis, not of subjectivity, but of intersubjectivity and of its contrib contribution to our constitution of the world, the significance that we give to things. It is in the centrality of our knowing and perceiving in relationship to others, with or against them, that our varying, various intentions and meanings emerge. In every encounter between individuals, you know, from work to family to lovers to friends, in every encounter between individuals or between individuals and things, I mean, we don't just live in a world of people, we live in a, in a world of living beings, for example. Many of us have pets. That's a particular constitution, isn't it? A pet. Many of us have living beings, other living beings live in our houses like dogs and cats and other stuff. So it's not just in relationship to other human beings, it's in, re in relationship to, to things in general. Um, in that encounter, subjectivity actually generates a type of intersubjectivity. That is actions, emotions, affects, or being which is oriented to the existence of the other person. And then we can go back the other way. Similarly, in every encounter between individuals, intersubjectivity generates a type of subjectivity, a type of personal aspect, because individuals, when we, when we talk with someone, we don't always agree with them. Um, we calab calibrate our own interpretations with what they're telling us about what happened or the world. And sometimes we dissent from those understandings of other people. So you can say intersubjective relations actually produces ourselves as different, but in subjective, our subjectivity when we relate to other people also makes us uh, un understand that we are more than just ourselves, that we are also the relations that we are entering into all the time. Okay, can I give one example here of intersubjectivity? I'm gonna give a personal example. So my father now is, is 88 years old and he's just, beginning to suffer from dementia. Now, I'm very close to my father and I see him regularly. And there's a very strong intersubjective effect is, is happening to me when I go and see my father. And it's coming through his whole body. For example, his walking frame. And then we can say his forgetting of conversations that are, we've unfolded as we talk together. And you know, in a conversation with someone you clarify understandings about the world. It's really terrible talking now with my father because we have a really nice clarifying conversation about something and five minutes later he's asked exactly the same question because he's forgotten that we'd even spoken about it. So um, the, the degradation of his body, the degradation of his perceptual capacities, the fact that I have to hold his arm when we go walking, what I can say, the general shrinking of him and of his world, a scaling down of his abilities. Now, all of these are occurring right in front of my eyes and through my ears. And on top of that, of course, I'm perceiving, I'm perceiving his own distress about what's happening to him and then faced with my own sadness. And on top of that, I also then am made to begin to think about how his process of aging begins to concern myself because his, his subjective being forces upon me a new comprehension of my temporality, 
you know, that I am a being in time, I'm an aging being in time, and it also forces upon me a proper realization of my embodied aging. It's not a theoretical insight, it's forced upon me by the fact of an intersubjective encounter with another person. It forces upon me a new understanding of what it, what it means that I'm going to die too, that he's going to die soon, and that I too am a mortal being. So we can say these new insights that have come about through an intersubjective encounter, these, these are not just you know, a, an abstract assertion about being like, yeah, human beings are mortal and we all have to die some way. These are truths now which have come to me intersubjectively and as a living being, they're not theoretical truths. They're truths that I have to cope with now in my own living. These are truths that have now altered me, truths that have been constituted for me, not by some, you know, someone saying all human beings have to die, but because I'm confronted with the corporality of my father's body right in front of me. So that is a really good example to me of what phenomenology means by saying our perception of the world has in core intersubjective dimensions and those intersubjective dimensions give us ways of accessing the type of you know, our, our new understandings of something. Okay, three, <laughs> temporality. Husserl was really interested in time consciousness and it's a very complicated aspect of his work, So, uh, which I don't really understand. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about time consciousness, but I do wanna talk about the phenomenological um, insights into the fact that individual subjective and intersubjective constitution of the world, the phenomenology's topic, is a temporal process. That is, it unfolds and emerges in time in the course of our living, in the course of experience. So according to Levinas, for example, he says, a sequence of acts that perceive an identical thing under new conditions may either increase one's intuitive knowledge of that thing or contradict earlier intuitions so that the sense of what is acquired is modified or cancelled. So Levinas is simply drawing, effect, drawing our attention to the fact that how we experienced our friend two weeks ago may be different to how we experience our friend in the future. And that different knowledge of the person then modifies our perception and our constitution of that person. Think of it like this. Imagine if you have this terrible thing that happens to you. Um, your best friend who you've been friends with and really intersubjectively close and sharing things and you know, becoming to joint positions about the world, etc., interpretations, emotions. Imagine if that friend betrays you. What a, what a terrible, terrible thing to happen. But of course, it's drawing attention for phenomenology to the temporality of our perceptions. They're constantly changing according to the various temporal time that they occur in. So Merlus Ponti, example of an, of, you know, an unclimbable cliff face, actually draws attention to how the body's historic engagement with things through the using those things in turn generates the present perception. Like you become a rock climber and you learn that two years, let's just say you stop climbing for two years. Two years later, you're walking in the forest and suddenly you have an unclimbable rock face. You notice an unclimbable rock face. And that's because two years ago, there was already types of modifications of our perception of the world and that you know, can unfold again in time into the future. So I think that means we can see that for phenomenology, there is a tension in our perceptions between the influence of the past and the efficacy of the present. And each of those are cast for, for Husserl in the light of differing anticipations about the future. Okay, that sounds complicated. Just, we can make it easier. Just say we are really worried about the ecological future of the planet. And now we notice an event for someone who doesn't have a consciousness that is directed to ecological um, disaster, they may not get affected by, let's say, the fact that you notice one spring, the flowers open late. But if you have a 
consciousness around you know, a perception of the world which is, includes something around climate change, that little phenomenological fact gives a completely different meaning to you. You understand that the flowers are opening late because this is a sign of an unfolding future. The future reaches back to you and it helps you perceive the meaning of what, it, what the, the flowers opening late might mean. If you didn't worry about ecological disaster in the future or as it's unfolding now, you may not notice that the flowers have, have opened late or you might not have that in, in, you may not give that meaning to it. So we can say to some sure extent, the consequences of past intersubjective relations and events and collective histories continue in the present despite their completion as a discrete act. And we can also say that new events and intersubjective relations are perceived in the light of these previous relations and happenings. I mean, I guess the phenomenology of trauma is basically making that point. So no, if you haven't had a traumatic thing that's happened to you in the past, there's not something might happen in the present and it doesn't have the meaning that it does for someone who has a traumatic act in the past. And that's all we're saying when we say the consequences of past relations and events continue in the present, even though that event is finished, so that new events and, and relations are perceived in the light of the past event. And I think there's a nice quote from T.S. Eliot from the core, Four Quartets poem. He makes the phenomenological point. He says, not the intense moment, isolated with no before and after, but a lifetime burning in every moment. Every new act of perception has a heavy genealogy of past perceptions, past ways that we've constituted the world um, to make our perceptions always understood as temporal in some way or other. Or other. Okay, now I had more to talk about temporality, but I'm just going to go over that because otherwise I won't finish. And I can see I'm, I'm going with, I don't want to go too much over time. Okay, another useful idea of phenomenology, spatiality. <clears throat> A phenomenological social science discerns that individual subjective and intersubjective constitution or modification of the sense of the world is also a spatial process. Our perceptions unfold and emerge in place in the course of our experience. So let me give a really nice quote. It's from Steinmuller. He says, when you lose your car keys or your house keys, let's say, lose your car keys, he says the world transforms into a map of potential key locations. Every place, the pocket of your jacket, the slot behind the sofa, the chest of drawers by the door is somewhere where the keys could be now, where they have been in the past or where you might place them in the future. Not only are the spatial coordinates of your world now readjusted to the search for the keys, but so too are the temporal time coordinates of the world. What you did in the moments before you lost your key and what will you do in the future? Now they only make sense in according to the lost keys. So the, the act of the lost keys now completely reinterprets what's important for you about the past. You might have come home, or you want to go out, let's say, and you've had a really nice day, and you go, oh, God, where's my car keys? And then suddenly you stop thinking about what you're thinking about, and you go, well, when did I use the car last? Oh, yeah, it was yesterday. What did I do? Where did I come from? Oh, did I go shopping? Oh, did I put it in the shopping bag, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a whole new uh, modification of place. And that's one of the core interests of phenomenology about what, how, what's involved in our perception of, not just of time here, but our perception of place. Place and space uh, is one of the really big interests of phenomenology and especially in human geography, because human geography of course is also interested in the creation and the constitution and the personal meaning of space for people. And that's really a phenomenological concern. Uh, okay. In skillment and perception. Now, Husserl never used this word. So this is not a Husserlian word, but it's really coming out of other people's work on phenomenology. So <clears throat> phenomenology establishes for social science the importance of 
embodied sedimentation of in educated knowledge and skills. Given that what phenomenology is interested is in how, our, how the modification of our conscious attention, or we can say it in another way, how the fostering of our dispositions becomes become contributing infrastructure to a person's perception of the world. Okay, let me give an example. For example, imagine that you have a you're you're doing a you have a musical education, and you have a musical education that uh, in polytonality, and you begin to be trained to hear five, let's say, four or five melodic lines that are being played, different melodic lines that are being played at the very same time. Now, that's actually really hard. If you listen to a piece of music, you can do the experiment. It's really hard to focus on the bass line and also on the singing at the same time. As soon as you switch your attention to the singing, the bass line recedes into the background. Of course, backgrounding and foregrounding are core phenomenological ideas. So you can imagine an education that somehow or other through the processes actually begins to teach you to be able to hear more than one, to focus on more your attention and to really take account of, to really notice and perceive more than one melodic line. That's what we can say is in skillment. And the more skilled you are in a certain practice, the more, of course, that skills affects how you interpret the world. So a core phenomenological insight. Remember, phenomenology is interested in how we perceive the world. And one of the core things it wants to talk about is the fact that a skilled apprenticeship of all different kinds from anthropology, from intellectual disciplines, to craft skills, to music, to aesthetic skills, to practical skills, all give us a different world because they allow us different Lay, allow us different ways and of directing our attention to the world. Of course, the core phenomenological point. For example, if you have, want to have a look at, there's a very nice article by Alessandro Duranti. He looks at how instructors, instructors in jazz classes tried to develop in students what he calls a jazz way of listening to music. Okay, so that's interesting. We suddenly realise that there's jazz ways and non-jazz ways of listening to music. The music changes according to a certain pedagogy that we've gone through. Let's think about it another way. Think about how an ignorant ear, I mean an ear that isn't trained, may perceive the call to prayer or to the ezam. I mean, people who don't understand Arabic hear it. They may be aroused by the sound in some, by the sound in some way like it, not like it, whatever, but they're not, because they don't understand Arabic, they're not, they ha only have a certain perception of it. Of course, if you can understand Arabic, or even more so, if you can understand the makam in which that ezan, the sabha ezan, or the evening ezan is being recited, of course, that gives you a different type of interpretation of, and a different constitution of the ezan. And that goes for everything. I mean, I read a really interesting article recently about the genre of death metal. I actually like all types of music and I like death metal as well. And I know most people think it's horrible because it's just screaming. Um, and it is screaming, but actually the more you listen to death metal, and this isn't just me, um, a recent study says that the more you become skilled in listening to death metal, the more you become able to understand the intelli intelligibility of the vocalization lines. I and mean, you can just Google into your, um, into YouTube death metal and you probably won't understand a single aspect of the words. It's just screaming. But the more you listen, the more that you can decipher it. So there's a really good example. Now, this is a core aspect of social science, of course. In the Algerians, that Bourdieu's first book, he says, the embodied process of acquiring knowledge, he just calls that a cultural apprenticeship. Whereas Husserl says this sort of embodied skill acquisition is what it means to live in a life world. That's his term, the life world. And, but we can say it for ourselves. The university values this disciplining of students' perceptual capacities because we want our students to skillfully insert the discipline's presuppositions into the world when they're trying to understand something in their 
research. Okay, I'm going to go through pretty quickly now in these last two last two things. Sorry, because I know I've gone over the last two useful ideas of phenomenology for the social science, <clears throat> and I want to bring them together in number six and seven. So Husserl said that he discovered something called the natural attitude. And in relationship to the natural attitude, he also said he discovered something called the phenomenological reduction. Bourdieu, if you read Bourdieu's work, he uses the natural attitude all the time. For Bourdieu, by the natural attitude, he just means the habitus and the inculcating of dispositions, which are then um, the dispositions by which a person you know, interprets the world for, them, for themselves. So the natural attitude has gone way out, way beyond Husserl's work, and it's gone into the social, core social sciences. So what is the natural attitude? The natural attitude for Husserl, and this is, sorry, this is the last, it is a technical and a bit confusing. The natural attitude concerns our certitude about being in our effective involvement in the world, which involves what Husserl describes as our naivety, with which we presuppose that the world is self-evidently in being, that the world is self-evidently given to us by experience as really out there. So I'm hoping you can see that all the things I've spoken about are problematizing that the idea that the world just self-evidently exists out there and that we have some easy objective knowledge of, of it. Actually, Husserl that says that idea is the idea of science. It's the natural sciences, and he says it's best understood as a natural attitude. The natural attitude assumes the existence of a subject-independent world, whereas phenomenology says there's no such thing as a subject-independent world. There is a world for subjects. It, of course, talks about how that world can become a world into subjective world for more than one person as well. But that's what phenomenology at its basis, its insight is. So Husserl says, the natural attitude assumes the existence of a subject independent world. It originates in our existential dwelling in the world, pursuing our activities, our projects, our relationships. He says, in the living of which we direct our attention to various elements of those activities, entities and relations. Even as when we do that, and we've seen this in the idea when you walk in the forest and you don't hear something because you're talking with your sister on the telephone, he says, um, these modifications in our consciousness lead to the disappearance of some of their dimensions. Okay, give, let me give you a, another example. Think about playing tennis. Okay, I like tennis. I play tennis quite often. So in tennis, when you're playing tennis, you don't have time to say to yourself, Change your grip when you're hitting backhand or forehand. Swing from high to low. Oh, get your feet in a proper position. Oh, don't forget to put your head down. So what Husserl is drawing attention to in the idea of the natural attitude is that the natural attitude just undergirds the everyday life that we live, as it were, naturally. You know, dealing in a straightforward way with other human beings, animals, playing tennis, etc., because we don't have time to reflect upon our activities when we're doing them. We just do them. And so the natural attitude is just the perspective of a person who is engaged in doing something. And Husserl wants to draw attention to how that, of course, creates a certain aspect of the world. I mean, at least when I'm playing tennis, even though I don't say to myself, look at the ball, I probably am looking at the ball. But as I play tennis, of course, the world constrains and shrinks down to the tennis court. And that's what a natural attitude does. Um, okay, Durante calls the natural attitude for the social science. He says we could call this the cultural attitude. And of course, anthropology has had a long history of critiquing ethnocentrism. To say that ethnocentrism doesn't realize that your particular cultural way of understanding the world is just a phenomenological natural attitude. It's, it constitutes the world, but it's, and it's a natural way of living, but it's not the only way of living, et cetera. Um, okay, now there's some other complicated aspects of Husserl's understanding of the natural attitude, but I haven't got time for that. So I'll just go on to the other great insight 
of her soul, which is the phenomenological reduction, because her, her soul made the point that you, you can only identify the natural attitude because you also have the idea of a phenomenological reduction. So for phenomenological reduction is what her soul says, it involves various methods by which we neutralize the naivety of our claim that the world exists independently of us. The phenomenological, the intention of the phenomenological reduction is to first to encounter and describe our actual experience of the world as we're doing things, the first person perspective, and second, to gain a sense of perspective on why we are interpreting the world as we are. So the phenomenolo phenomenological reduction is trying to understand why we, why we constitute the world the way that we do. Um, so this works a bit differently in maybe different, different di disciplines. Michael Jackson, uh, the great anthropologist, puts it like this. The phenomenological reduction prepares the ground for detailed descriptions of how people immediately experience space, time, and the world in which they live. He gives the example of this. Now, anthropology is a theoretical discipline. In the course of its of its you know, fieldwork encounter with people from all around the world who live in very different conditions. It, it may develop a typology, let's say, of religion, and it might have invented the category of totemism. Let's say, actually, Durkheim. It has the idea of totemism. Now, what Michael Jackson is saying is, actually, that's a very non-phenomenological understanding of how people live their religious life. And what a phenomenological account is interested in. It's not interested in theori theoretical abstractions like totemism. It's interested in describing how people who's, who have been called by outsiders to have a totemistic religious system. It's interested in how they actually experience space, time and the world in which they live. And it's not therefore making some other type, typological claim or categorical, categorical claim about now I'm going to give another language and, say, and a sort of a social scientific language to say, here they are doing some other type of you know, thing which is coming from outside their own life world. But the second thing of, of a phenomenological anthropology is that it also seeks to thematize the conditions of the possibility of subjectivity and experience, both for ourselves, for the anthropologist who's doing the work, and also for people themselves. Um, okay, so I'll just finish up here, perhaps by drawing, by talking really briefly about Merleau-Ponty. So Merleau-Ponty um, argued that the question of the reduction was of crucial significance for phenomenology. Um, and he, of course, gets that from his reading of Husserl. Um, so for Husserl, the reduction enables us to put into question, so I'm citing Husserl, put into question the certitude about being that operates in my experience of the world. The reduction enables me and others to attend both to the presentation of the world for my conscious experience, but also to step back from that and to get some account of why am I interpreting and experiencing the world in that way way. So phenomenology is not just a pure description. It actually is interested in describing people's experience of the world and your own experience of the world so that you can go beyond that and get some insight into why you're constituting the world that way. It's, but it says really clearly you have to go through the experiential domain first and you can't ignore that. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to jump make a logical jump to give some social science explanation about you know, why such and such a thing happened. Um, so we can basically say attending for phenomenology to our perception of something helps us to reflect upon or to part account for the manner in which that perceived entity appears for us. So put it another way, the reduction obstructs our taking things for granted. And I'll finish up with the final quote from Levinas. Levinas actually citing ideas from her soul, 
says, phenomenology has no other goal than to place, again, the world of objects in the concrete web of our life and to understand them on that basis, the types of intentions, positions, uh, socializations, the skills, the temporality of our perceptions, so that we can put them into our everyday life and also get some idea about why we interpret those things in the way we do. And I'll finish there by saying, you, when you think about phenomenology in that way, you can see that there's an overlap between phenomenology and psychoanalysis. Because psychoanalysis is also, we can say, another discipline which tries to say, um, okay, you had to a person, or the person says, I don't understand. When my mother did this to me or said this to me, I had this huge, terrible feeling, or I had this response to it. Psychoanalysis, we can say, is trying to do a phenomenological reduction. It's trying to say to the person, yeah, okay, you interpreted it and you acted in this way. How can we understand the backgrounded historical elements that went into your current perception of the event of the encounter with your mother, let's say. Um, and so that, that's another really complicated area because Husserl has a very heavy critique of psychology. Um, but we can sort of see that the idea of a modif of a reduction is goes beyond the social sciences and goes into, into other disciplines as well. Okay, <laughs> sorry about how long I've gone. Oh, I, I have finally finished. I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much. I think it was very well, I think, structured in a way that, you know, you took us step by step. Uh, and then, you know, it, it really made, made it clear to me. Uh, we have uh, questions, maybe. Uh, yes, we'll get to questions. I remember one from Sally. He was asking, I'm new to phenomenology. And when it is applied to social sciences, what are the weaknesses and the critique of maybe phenomenology? This is one question by Sally and the other is by me. For example, I'm just thinking the application of this uh, 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 in research. For example, I had follow-up interviews with, uh, with the targets of Islamophobia. And I asked them what happened, when happened, and all these details. As a researcher, should I go through these layers, seven layers, and interpret it? Or in my questions, should I try to bring out these uh, aspects so that you know, I can capture it? So is it, is it me bringing or forcing uh, the participant to you know, uh, go into these layers? Or is it uh, whatever is, you know, explain or a picture or the, you know, portrayal or something, or let's say, or whatever the story is, is it me as a researcher trying to bring, you know, these aspects to my interpretation of what has been told to me? Yeah. And in the meantime, everyone, can you please uh, type in your questions? We have about five minutes. I'm sorry, we didn't really. Sorry, I've gone, I've gone way over time, but it's really hard to summarize phenomenology yes. like in, as you can see, the comple complexities in that. Okay. Um, critiques of phenomenology and social science. I think that was one of the, quest the, the question, Daria, that someone said. Um, look, Bourdieu, in you know, his very influential book, An Outline of a Theory of Practice, actually begins by doing a critique of, of phenomenology. He calls it subjectivity or like subjectivism. So if you're interested in it, he has a certain critique. And of course, he, his, his critique is both interesting and unfair because when you look at Bourdieu's work, he's using phenomenology all the time. All those, five, all those useful ideas of phenomenology, he's using them. He's interested in temporality. He's interested in the natural attitude. He just calls it the habitus. Um, he's interested in apprenticeship and in skillman. He calls that the inculcation of dispositions. Um, he's interested in temporality because he looks at the time of a performance. Now, in a gift exchange, Bourdieu is looking at how the, the, a structural understanding of gift exchange is not correct because it unfolds in time and it can always go wrong. Now, Levi Strauss says gift, the logic of a gift exchange is you give, it's an exchange, and you have to give it back. That's the structure. <clears throat> it's a reciprocal structure, whereas Bourdieu says, no, 
actually a gift exchange unfolds in time and people can delay an exchange for very clear reasons um, in, in all social life, or you can actually refuse to reciprocate if you want to break the relationship. So he, of course, is very sensitive to temporality of action. But, you know, he has a critique. I mean, I just think it's unfair because he, um, he has no reduction. Maybe that's what it is. So he takes all of the, the aspects of phenomenology as it tries to describe everyday life. And then he basically says, uh, well, we have to be more than interested in, in everyday life and the, the experience of people. We have to take a step back. And because we're social scientists, we have to say, what is structuring people's perception of everyday life? So that's a critique we can say of Bourdieu. He thinks phenomenology doesn't allow us to understand what the causes of experience are. And of course, because no, he's a, he's a very radical leftist in one way and, and probably a, a materialist or a Marxist. And so Bourdieu isn't interested in describing the world. He's actually interested in how we can change it. And that's why he's interested in the question of structures that constitute you know, someone's existence and interested in how they're reproduced because in the end, maybe Bourdieu hopes that by understanding the reproduction of social structures, we might be able to understand some way of changing them. Uh, of course, when you read Bourdieu, there's no, no way of changing anything. His system is so closed in upon itself that the question of why things change in Bourdieu is a big problem. And anyway, Bourdieu, we know, is just interested in reproduction. That's what he's focusing on. He's not interested so much in transformation. So, look, there's a good critique, you could say, that for Bourdieu of phenomenology. Debbie, your question is a really nice one because Islamophobia, I mean, we do a phenomenological analysis of Islamophobia. In the first instance, we acknowledge that this is a constitution of Islam. It's a very emotional one, uh, etc. And we will have questions to, if, if our concern is to explain to someone else what Islamophobia is, that's one, from, that's our concern, isn't it? So we have to take account of what our interests are as one core aspect of how we're interpreting something. If our concern is to change the Islamophobic person's idea about Islam, that's a different project. So that's what phenomenology is saying. We should be clear about our own intentions because our intentions constitute the object of the study, especially for academics. So that makes a good, a good question. Like if you're, um, you realize that uh, someone's in interpretation of Islam is, is, we might say, because we think we know more about Islam, we might say it's full of distortions and crazy ideas about Islam. Because that maybe we have a real, the real idea of Islam and an Islamophobic Islam is just an imagined Islam. Okay, so that, that obviously is partially true because phenomenology is interested in enskillment. And when it talks about enskillment, that's in all levels. I mean, you can be enskilled in music and you can be enskilled in religion, in how to practice it and, and more profound dimensions of it. So it, it, phenomenology is not going to say anyone's version of Islam is just as good as anyone else's. And if some Islamophobe goes and says, oh, the Quran is a book for terrorism, it doesn't go, oh, yeah, well, that's, that's, that's their perspective and that's fine. I mean, it wants to have a reduction. <laughs> like it wants to then move both for yourself because it has to be both people and to the other person. So the question becomes, if your interest is in changing the Islamophobic ideas of other people, what types of phenomenological activities can you do? And look, I reckon Affinity has done a very good job by making a decision about what it will do. Okay, it, it may be difficult to get really Islamophobic people to come to, you know, to the house dinners that Affinity organised to meet other Muslims. But that is a, for phenomenology, that's a beautiful modification of perception, potentially. So I can, you can say you yourself or Affinity organisation actually has tried to modify people's enskillment about Islam. You can put it like that, right? 
On the other hand, if you're, you have other, we have more than one intention. If your intention is to tell other people, you know, your audience that you're writing to, about why Tom Smith is Islamophobic, then your intention isn't to change Tom Smith here. Your intention is to somehow explain to other people why it is that Tom Smith has these ideas. And, of course, you know, you're doing that through your research. So you're doing maybe research with people who have certain ideas about Islam. So you can begin to have some understanding of the life world or you know, of their lived experience that may make them have these stupid feelings about Islam. Um, or you might just be looking, doing a textual analysis you know, of Islamophobic texts by academics and other people to explain to someone else. So it really you know, depends on what your intention is. To me, <clears throat> That, that's why I like anthropology. Um, anthropology's main discipline is field work. And that means, that's to say, in your case, if you're doing an anthropological uh, encounter with Islamophobic, you do your research with Islamophobic people. You live, uh, live with them. You, you try to get the perspective of their, of their life world. I mean, Hussel calls it the life world. Anthropology just can, can call it something else. Sometimes we call it culture, which is a really bad word. Sometimes we just call it the world of, of other people, etc. And anthropology values a long time spent in living alongside or with those people to get a really proper understanding of the deeply embedded types of, of reductions that would need to go on to find out what their stance is on something. So I, I don't do it. I didn't do it on Islamophobia. When I went to Istanbul, and my topic was political activists. No, I did a year or more altogether of field work with political activists in Istanbul to learn about how they interpreted the city, to learn about how their activist group helped them to reinterpret and you know, modify their understandings of the city. So, uh, yeah, you can see a phenomenological methodology which is really coming probably around fieldwork is a very valuable way for understanding the constitution of the world by both yourself and those people because sometimes anthropology also says it's hard to do a, a reduction for yourself and one way of doing it like to understand what you value about Islam you can get clearer on that by talking about people who value it in other ways so then you can get a clearer idea about your own natural attitude. You get an insight. I mean, that's what phenomenally is right. You do a reduction on your own natural attitude. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's how I would uh, bring those things together. Thank you. I think it was really important to see how we would apply it to research. Good that you gave that example from your own research as well. Thank you for that. I'm conscious of time. Where, uh, maybe can I give your email to a few uh, of the uh, I think uh, attendees so they have questions. Maybe if they want further, maybe you know resources and maybe ideas. Maybe they can contact you because um, I think Helen, you want to say something. Yeah, can you unmute yourself? Uh, okay, you need to unmute yourself, Helen. I'm sorry. No, anyway. Down the left hand corner. Yes, yes. I can't, I think I can't do it. Hello, now yeah, you can see. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. I've mm -hmm. been having trouble uh, all afternoon. My apologies. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm working in the area of religious education and how teachers educate about Islam. And yeah. I've got all these ideas, and I'm using the term instead of constituting or constitution. I'm using the educational term of construction and yep. constructivism. And um, I've just found this talk today absolutely uh, sort of groundbreaking and I'm so grateful and I would like to keep in touch. So thank you to you both. Thanks, Helen. Cheers. Be nice to keep in touch, yeah. Yes, and also I will, I, I'm just copying and pasting the comments from our audience as well. They found it really helpful. You know, they're saying we started to understand it right now. So I think it was very useful for many of us. Thank you very much. 
And maybe if they have questions and if they want to discuss further with you, they will contact you. Thank you very much. It was really useful, especially so complicated things and starting with an instructor and then, you know, taking the steps together with the person is really helpful. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, thanks so much to everyone who you know, came to the talk and who could last, last the distance for a, for, a re, for a complicated but a very useful um, way of, it's a theoretical, but it's a way of living as well. I mean, you can put it like that. It's a methodology, but it's also incredibly useful for your own life um, to take phenomenological perspective of what's going on in our emotional and other ways of being in the world. So. I actually find it just as useful for that as it is for intellectual work. Yes, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Wonderful, very helpful. Okay, thanks, Nadia. A lot of a lot of comments from our our audience. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone.